The minute an ETF comes with the underlying being a mark to market, Bitcoin itself, that will be a multi-billion dollar ETF in 24 hours. That's my opinion, because it will let you So in, in 2017, when I put on my first position of some Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, at the time, the regulator, if you recall, was, was very vocal about their, um, their position on crypto, and particularly at the time, tokens. There was a lot of tokenization going on. Uh, regulator was not happy about it. Those of us that worked in the financial services industries, either as um, you know, chairman or issuers of securities knew very well uh, that, that we would be risking our mainstream businesses if we were going to be, become so-called crypto cowboys and start to fight with regulators, which is, you, you just don't want to do that when you're, when you're in the financial services industry. You can't afford it and your clients don't want it. And I was in the indexing business. So when I saw the criticism, I immediately realized, well, this is not going to go anywhere. And I was a critic, but things changed and I changed too. And I'll tell you what happened. I started to notice in other geographies, in other uh, countries, the regulators were starting to be more progressive about the use of cryptocurrencies as payment systems or storage of value. The Swiss, the English, the British, the Germans, the Canadians, the United Arab Emirates, the Canadians were the very first to issue an ETF with the underlying being Bitcoin, an ETF with the underlying being Ethereum. I remember the moment that I said, okay, I've, I've, got to, I've got to get serious about this because it's here to stay, it's not going away. And, e and even our own domestic regulators were starting to offer you know, palm branches towards the industry, realizing how fast it was growing. But for me, the specific use case was last year when we sold off a significant portion of our commercial real estate in our operating company. and. It was, it was significant because it was over a 30% weighting of what we were managing and we generated a lot of cash. I called the cash desk up. I said, what can we get on this cash while we redeploy it? 20 basis points, 0.2%. Now inflation right now is over 5%. So that means I'm basically being taxed, you know, at around 4.8% on, on holding cash. And that, that was not a sustainable model. That's when we first started investing in stablecoin and staking stablecoin and getting a lending desk going and all of that happened at the same time. I hired multiple people for this. Um, it, it is a nascent industry. It took me six months to get my own internal compliance officer on board and even longer to get my auditors, external auditors to sign my statements. But that's all past us now because when I started in stablecoin, I think there was $2 billion worth of USDC. Now it's $30 billion. So clearly I'm not the only person trying to solve this problem. What I'm hoping for this year, I would like to see this issue resolved. As you know, there's been some controversy with the regulator around stable coins. There's some litigation out there around, around a particular stable coin. That's not helpful. None of us want to litigate the regulator. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It would be better that we get a ruling on what the terms are on stable coins so that we could you know, right now I have to treat it like a stock, like an equity. I can't own more than 5% of it in any portfolio. When in fact, I don't think stable coins are stocks. I think they're cash proxy, but I can't use it that way because the regulator ha has not spoken yet. There's a tremendous amount of institutional capital sitting on the sidelines. I service institutions every day and sovereign funds as well. And most of them have not even got into the asset class in any way whatsoever. So when we talk about, you know, Bitcoin, which is, probably one of the most desirable assets for a pension plan. We have to deal with ESG issues. We have to deal with issues around compliance on um, ethics. You know, where was it mined? All this stuff still remains out there. And it, you know, it, it, it's something that will over time get resolved. But for all of the excitement within the crypto community, it's a fraction of the potential of this market if we could get the rules. Now, I, I am encouraged that the regulator is, is taking their time to get it right because our regulator should set the rules for the world and everybody's waiting for that to happen. Well, you're right. I, I'm a big believer um, in investing in the infrastructure of an nascent industry. It's the picks and shovels analogy for the gold rush. But in the case of BitBuy, that was the very first market exchange awarded by the regulator in Canada. 
And you've got to remember the regulator in Canada is very progressive. Again, they were the first to do ETFs in Bitcoin, the first to do ETFs in Ethereum. And it took years, but that was the very first award. And it has 375,000 accounts. And what you like about an exchange is you're agnostic to asset price. You, in fact, like volatility. And I know with certainty, and this reminds me of the early days of Amazon. I've been an Amazon shareholder for 17 years. It corrected 50% to 30%, 38%, 48% every year, sometimes twice. It was immensely volatile, but look where you are today. When it comes to crypto, same thing. So if you own the exchange, you are actually participating in the volatility and you're agnostic to the price, not just on Bitcoin, to Ethereum and other assets. And so for me, that's very important. And I like what WonderFi is doing because that's just one of their mandates. They're also simplifying decentralized finance because it's incredibly complicated to actually set up and maintain a DeFi wallet. Most people can't do it. Real, the real issue here is to get, and I keep saying this over and over again because it's, the crypto community is a fantastic community. There's so many great ideas, but we're not there yet until we can get the sovereign and pension plans to be able to allocate their three to 5% weighting because that's where the real money is. And we're, we're just not there yet. We've got a lot of work to do. And you know, what I love about the FTX guys is I've, I've had sessions with some of the designers and developers there saying, look guys, add this report. We're gonna need this for compliance, add this report. Because it was born out of the necessity and need to trade globally, but now as, as institutions and compliant, uh, you know, people are starting to use the platform. They're adding those features that are gonna make it better and better and better to be something an institution can work with. Many institutions cannot actually own Bitcoin directly or Ethereum directly. So they take proxies. They try and find equities that are basically proxies to the volatility of the pricing of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And one of the narratives that they've, and I've heard this multiple times in just the last few weeks is, it's all about customer acquisition costs. So when you're acquiring a customer in a centralized platform, like an exchange with a dealer broker, such as Bitbuy, and that same individual decides that they want to hold their NFTs in a decentralized wallet and you don't have one, all the money you spent acquiring that customer is lost as they go drift off somewhere else. You want to keep them in your ecosphere, which is why I love what Ben is doing over at Wonderfy because he said, if they want decentralized, we got it. If they want centralized, we've got it. If they want a broker dealer account, we've got it. So he's capturing his customers, 375,000 plus of them so far, many more to come, I'm sure and offering decentralized apps and giving them full service. That really rings true to me as an investor because now I can use this as an equity, give it a 5% weighting in a fund or whatever in, in, in my operating company and say, this is a proxy to anybody interested in dealing in crypto, whether it's centralized or decentralized, but the customer acquisition cost, the bigger it grows is less and less. That is going to be a constant. Companies that are going to survive in this space are going to consolidate quickly, get large, reduce customer acquisition costs, and provide full service. We need more transparency. We, know, we need more security. And above all, we need more simplicity. I mean, it shouldn't be that hard because you've got hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, that are sitting on maybe fourteen, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in their saving account making nothing that would love to make 6% a year if they could figure out how to stake a stable coin and they have no idea how to do it or get the tax reporting they need in all the That's jurisdictions the they have to report in. It's a nightmare, yeah. but such an opportunity. The minute an ETF comes with the underlying being a mark to market Bitcoin itself, that will be a multi-billion dollar ETF in 24 hours. That's my opinion, because it will let you in any equity portfolio, simply buy the ETF for the three to 5% weighting you want. Then you've got your exposure directly to the price of a Bitcoin. I don't like that product with futures because there's a lot of tracking error with futures. It's got to be the real thing. Now, there may be an issue around institutions that say, I don't know where the coin was mined, so I need it to be coins that I know are mined ESG compliant. You've seen a lot of that coming out of uh, BlackRock, the Larry Fink letter every every year. I mean, we, it'd be really great to get some clarity because that's the largest asset manager on earth and they have a, their own ESG committee and they're dictating a lot of policy on hydrocarbons and all kinds of other issues. And generally speaking, it's being well received by the institutional client. Bitcoin is not high on their list as a clean asset yet. So the industry has some work to do in terms of getting, and I, I keep saying this, it's all great, 
you know, if, if you want to buy some Bitcoin, but if you really want to see it achieve, you know, $100,000 and above, it has to be compliant on an ESG basis to institutions. I would be more optimistic that a ruling on stablecoin is coming. Yeah. Stablecoin is a massive asset class. Now, if Circle has to turn itself into a bank, they'll probably do it. I'm just speculating, but the point is I use that platform too. And, and it's, you know, and, and that platform is getting better and better and better every month. And so it turn, again, it, it's, it's, it's all about compliance. When you're, when you're rolling contracts, 30 day contracts, and you've got your compliance department saying, where did that money go? Where is it right now? Where can I mark to market it at 401? That the platform has to deliver that stuff. And slowly they are. You can have a debate about it when it comes to mining coin being awarded coin and, and you know, the, the, the network fees that you get being different than the coin that's being awarded and all the rest of that. But having an ESG argument with your ESG office about Bitcoin is pointless. That they're not going, they're not going to change their mind unless you can prove to them that it is done according to the rules that they have decided to standardize on. I find it hilarious. People say, oh, I'm going to go and talk to my ESG officer and convince him I can buy Bitcoin. No, it's not going to happen. It, and it isn't, and it doesn't. And so th this issue is not going away. It will come up again in Bitcoin 2022 this year in February. It'll be, it'll be a huge issue because the demand is insatiable. Somebody's got to solve this, and I think as an industry, we will. I'm looking at investing in miners that can sh prove to me that they're keeping their coin on their balance sheet, that I can be an equity shareholder and they're 100% zero emission or at least have done it in a way that they can prove in an audit that they are doing it sustainably and according to ESG standards.